You start Hieronymus Bosch's brutal orchestra by learning that you are in purgatory and that you must seek revenge against the man that has killed you. You must find that man once he too dies and do only on God knows what to him. A petty goal, but let's be honest, you're not above this. Your name is Noak, and the black sludge with a skull helping you get your revenge is Bosch. Although your character in-game has a tough time understanding his fourth wall breaking advice, this journey isn't one Noah could make without him. A lot of things are left unclear. Who killed you and why? Who is Bosch and why does he want to help you? Is he right in guessing that you're a manifestation of his deep unresolved traumas? Most of these questions won't be answered, not in a satisfying way. You're told fate will do the rest. In purgatory there's fish, blood and guts, and most importantly, pigment. Pigments you can use to perform often deadly abilities to carve your way through rotting piles of bodies, music men, and various others otherworldly horrors. On your brutal journey, you'll meet many a fool, who will join your party if you meet their requirements. Though most of the time it'll be because they have nothing better to do, or because they feel the need to consume, and you're their next ticket to a meal. So what, is this another one of those weird gory indie games? Perhaps, but more importantly, the themes and ideas portrayed in it lay the groundwork to what I think are some of the most interesting and vital questions in philosophy, more specifically existentialism, and the meaning of life, or the lack thereof. But before we get there, we must first learn about the story and just what kind of picture it paints, as the lore is quite complicated and doesn't do much in terms of explaining. Bosch, the oil demon, and Noak are two parts of one person. They are the parts of personality theorized of by everyone's darling urologist and psychoanalyst, Sigmund Freud. Although many of his theories hold very little value today because of their pseudo-scientific nature, it's still a key part of Brutal Orchestra, so I think it's only fair that we analyze some parts of the story told to us through the lens of Freud. Bosch is the id. Freud's theory states that the id is a subconscious part of the personality, one from which stem the most primal and basic desires, like wanting to eat or have sex. Its only purpose is to get as much pleasure as possible without a care in the world for morality or social norms and it's the only part of a personality which exists from the moment a person is born. But because it's subconscious, it never interacts with the outside world, and therefore never develops. Here we have to pause for a moment. That last part didn't make much sense at all. For if young children do not have any sexual desires, then it seems at least some parts of the id develop later on, and aren't just something a person is gifted the moment they're born. For the most part, Freud's theory seems to map pretty cleanly onto our character of Bosch, He's angry, volatile, abusive, unreasonable, clueless, and totally prepared to do anything to get what he wants. Another crucial point is that Bosch is also, in terms of gameplay, a guide. In fact, without this guide, Noak would be unable to get anywhere by himself, because unlike Bosch, he has no knowledge of how to travel through purgatory. And so Bosch, the id, is doing as it's always done, and leading us to where it wants to go, to fulfill its desires. In this case, it's to murder a man who has caused you suffering and death for reasons yet unknown. Now on to Noak. He represents the superego, and it makes sense then that Bosch spends a good portion of his time speaking, verbally assaulting and diminishing Noak. He is the rule maker, the part which considers morality and social norms, and tries to take control of Bosch, and so Bosch utterly despises him. The superego is simultaneously the source of pride and doing what's right, and the guilt and shame which comes from disobeying it. It's not concerned with what's realistic, it only knows what's right, and strives to achieve it. Fans of Freud will know there's also a third part, but we'll discuss that a bit later. Now that we've laid the foundation, we can talk about philosophy. In the essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus, a French existential philosopher, though he rejected this label, describes his view on the meaninglessness of life, on suicide, and on other ways of dealing with this absurdity. He took the question of suicide to be of great importance, in fact, so great that he wrote the following. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, comes afterwards. After all, it is literally a matter of life and death. Camus strove to be rational, and he took life to be absurd due to its meaninglessness. And he found that other writers, though not always philosophers, when writing about the absurd, try to avoid or suppress it, often through invoking God and restoring hope through the meaning given by this divine being. He took this to be a grave mistake. 
First, it would be useful to go over his definition of absurd, as this can be easily misconstrued. When Camus states that life is absurd, he doesn't simply mean that it has no meaning, as the absurdity of life, he thought, was an emergent property of two propositions. The same way a physicalist in terms of philosophy of mind would say that something like sentience, or a mind, is an emergent property of the computations of the brain, or to give a simpler example, the same way waves in the ocean are an emergent property of a lot of water interacting with several other things like gravity of the planet and its atmosphere, Camus thought that absurdity is the emergent property of the inherent human desire to find the meaning of life and the universe's inability to fulfill that desire. Here I can offer a rough formalization and steelman of his argument. And if the only way for people to discover the ultimate meaning to all of existence is through rationality, and rationality can't demonstrate that all of existence is necessarily rational, meaning rationality cannot explain it, then it is impossible to know when the ultimate meaning to all of existence is discovered. Since Camus took both of the premises to be true, it couldn't help but follow that we can never know for sure that we have found the ultimate meaning of life. And since people will strive for it anyway, the absurd is created, which is the relationship between the two. There is no truth but merely truths. Another way to think about this is to think what it would mean for a meaning to be ultimate. What is a meaning if it's not corresponding to some mind-dependent goal or desire? To me at least, it seems like that's all a meaning can be, so there can be no ultimate meaning. There are certainly people who can have meaning in their lives, which are meanings created by their desires, but for there to be an ultimate meaning, it's almost like the universe itself would need to have desires and create a meaning out of that, which would indeed be ultimate. Now back to Camus. He compares this to the myth of Sisyphus, a man who was cast into the underworld to fulfill an endless task of rolling a boulder up a hill, except every time he gets to the top of that hill, the boulder rolls down and Sisyphus has to start all over again. Clearly an impossible task, and yet he perseveres and continues to roll that boulder, which is what Camus thought we should do when faced with the absurd, not try to hide from it or escape it, but to embrace it and live side by side with it without losing sight of it. There is a slight contradiction here though, with the story of Sisyphus and Camus' interpretation of it. For when Sisyphus is first allowed out of the underworld for a short while, he experiences life again and thinks of how great the things on earth are now that he's alive again and gets to experience them. He clearly wants to stay living instead of trying to complete his never-ending task. Unfortunately, Sisyphus is found again and cast into the underworld. It's not hard to see, however, that if given the choice, Sisyphus would have wanted nothing more than to stay in the land of the living. But when he had again seen the face of this world, enjoyed water and sun, warm stones and the sea, he no longer wanted to go back to the infernal darkness. Camus thought there were three ways of dealing with the absurd. The first is physical suicide, since if man is taken out of existence, there can no longer be the absurd since it's a relationship between man and the universe. But, he wrote, killing yourself is merely confessing that living is not worth the trouble. The second way is through hope, something he calls a leap of faith, whether this be the hope of the religious who believe in the eternal afterlife, even when rationality can't prove it, or through the hope of making a different kind of leap, a more secular one, a leap of logic, though Camus would likely also classify this as a leap of faith as it is also suspension of rationality. He pointed out that rationality can't prove that the universe is rational, and so, even if we find what we think is the ultimate meaning of everything, this can never be fully confirmed to be the case. Both these ways of escaping the absurd are just ways of suppressing it. Camus thought we ought to be rational to the bitter end, and accept that we can never have absolute knowledge of the universe's meaning. So instead of running away from the absurd, we should embrace rationality and stay fully aware of the absurd throughout our lives. A man is always a prey to his truths. He wrote. And so, if you were to be honest, you wouldn't turn away from the absurd or try escaping from it with unjustified hope or by extinguishing your consciousness. A way of doing this is living a life with your own meaning given to it, and to experience the absurd in its many forms instead of giving in to habitual living. Camus' problem with habitual living is that it can often be done without thinking which is basically ignoring the absurd, instead of living with it. To move to a more practical side of the discussion, he would say live in the today instead of living in tomorrow, since there's no guarantee that things will ever improve if you just accept your situation and hope that things will get better. Camus wrote of an actor as an absurd man, and one whose life sets a good example, who plays the role of many people living different lives, and thus all the different emotions and situations they experience as well. Actors acknowledge that their lives, 
or rather, the lives of people they act out, are quite short, like life itself, and that death is inevitable. Camus valued quantity over quality, which is why he preferred the life where one has a wide variety of experiences, rather than a few very deep ones. How exactly he quantifies experiences, he doesn't go on to explain, but we can get the general idea through the examples of the lives of rational and absurd men. As great of a thinker as Camus was, he wasn't without his faults. Another example he gives is someone who he took to be living his life to the fullest, while fully acknowledging the futility of it all. Don Juan, a fictional character who spent his life seducing women. He took each woman he was with to be a new conquest, and since there is no such a thing as ultimate love, he loved every woman in the same way. Now for some reason, Camus completely misses that women are being treated differently to men, not as subjects who are also aware of the absurd and must live with that in their hearts, but as things to be conquered. After passing through the far shore, the Orpheum, and possibly the Garden, you'll come across the final encounter, the person who has killed you and on whom you can now exact your revenge. This is it. That thing. It is a malformed child of unspeakable sins. This thing is no man. Its words are poison you cannot possibly overcome. That's strange. It looks awfully familiar, this pitiful corpse. It's clearly not in any state to fight you. In fact, it's dying and killing itself in the process. This is the ego, the person you were in life, and the third and intermediary part between Bosch and Nowak, the id and the superego. Its role is to find the middle ground between doing everything you want and find pleasurable, and the demands to be perfect. Find practical ways of achieving pleasure without completely disregarding social norms. He is the only one with a body out of the three of them, and it is bleeding. Now what was shown in the intro cutscene makes sense. The person jumping off the bridge was Nowak, and he is the person Bosch wants you to kill. A root cause, the origin of all of Nowak's desires, wants to end itself and the two entities who controlled it his entire life. Once the body is dead, it'll no longer have to suffer to deal with the pain or meaninglessness of the world. But you, the player, and Nowak don't have to kill it. He doesn't deserve to die. This thing is just a kid. So what happens if you just pass your turns? Noak rejects death. As you can imagine, Bosch isn't so happy. You sniveling mass of failure, crudely shaped into a man. Everything we have done merits oblivion. Why won't you just let us die? You crack our skull, bleed us in this pit, and won't even grant us mercy. It couldn't be much more clear how tired Bosch is of being controlled. He just wants to be done. Here I think it's useful to dive into another one of Freud's wild theories. In his book titled Morning and Melancholy, he describes two conditions which with today's understanding of psychology would probably be called depressive symptoms, more so of the melancholy than mourning. Mourning, from Freud's perspective, is simple enough to explain. It's a state of being of a person after they have lost something, maybe a loved one, or maybe a dream. This loss can be worked through until the person affected by it is no longer paralyzed by the sadness of the loss. Not so with melancholy. Freud thought, wrongly, that melancholy is when you are unable to work through the loss of something, because you have mistaken the thing you lost to be a part of yourself. When this happens, the feeling of hatred and anger towards the thing you lost is redirected at yourself. And so, to cease this thing from being, one must cease being, through suicide. Now clearly, this is gibberish, and has very little evidence for it, and just one counterexample is enough to prove that it's not the case. What about depressed people who don't feel any anger towards what they lost, and who don't feel any antagonistic emotions in relation to it? If Freud had listened to a few of such patients, and instead of trying to put them into neat little boxes, adjusted his theory, he would have realized that there are people who are in deep suffering, possibly because of a loss, or maybe because of the state of the world and how they are treated inside it, and they just want the suffering to end. And another thing is, Freud is kind of just a massive dick. It's hard to believe he had any respect or care for his patients, or the patients of his colleagues who suffered with melancholia. I mean, he literally wrote regarding people going through this that The patient represents his ego to us as worthless, incapable of any achievement and morally despicable. He reproaches himself, vilifies himself, and expects to be cast out and punished. He abases himself before everyone and commiserates with his own relatives for being connected with anyone so unworthy. And here comes the fucked up part. It would be equally fruitless from a scientific and therapeutic point of view to contradict a patient who brings these accusations against his ego. 
he must surely be right in some way, and be describing something that is as it seems to him to be. Indeed, we must at once confirm some of his statements without reservation. He really is as lacking in interest and as incapable of love and achievement as he says. Like damn, Freud, sweetie, you don't have to be on that shrug my grind set 24-7 and make everyone else join in too. Hey doc, I feel down lately. I just feel like I'm worthless and that nobody loves me. Yeah, well maybe you should stop being such a pathetic prick. Anyway, here's your cocaine prescription. I don't even necessarily disagree that maybe the best thing for them isn't to contradict them and say that they're worth everything and there's nothing wrong with them. But to be as callous to someone in an already extremely self-critical state, someone who's suffering because of something they see is caused by them, and say that it's true that they are incapable of love and achievement, as if this is a proposition that can easily be known to be true, can't be taken to be anything but cold-blooded and illogical. Sorry, I had to get that out. However pseudoscientific his theory is, it can still make sense of Noack's situation. It's very possible that Noack has lost something in his life, and this is why he hates himself, and wanted to commit suicide, and to bring in a bit of Camus. Maybe what he has lost is meaning. As to why, we'll return a bit later. We're both still bound to each other, not by blood, but by very being itself. Once Noack starts another run, another attempt to try to find himself, he speaks with Bosch. The id is tired of being kept alive in chains. He tries to kill Noack, but of course this has no effect, for there is nothing after purgatory. Killing you is almost as exhausting as dealing with you. You were a waste of flesh, and now dead, you've proven you are, by your very nature, a waste of space. I'm beginning to suspect that my lapse in concentration may have revealed us to intruding powers. And then he leaves, for an unknown amount of time. This is the point where you get to try to navigate through the purgatory, but to no avail, not without Bosch. But Noah can and does come across a stranger named Zanguango sitting by a campfire. Do you hear that? It almost sounds like music. Almost. May I take a guess? Don't know who you are anymore, and your deal with the devil went sour. Well, a broken clock is right twice, and if a clock can muster that, then you'd be shocked by what a broken person can do. Have you ever loaned yourself money? You ever ask yourself to move out the way because you were blocking the view? Hmm. Yeah, you just do it. You ever ask yourself a question? No? Why would you? You'd know the answer. But you have, haven't you? You see, we're not quite as unified as we like to think. Do you hear that? It's music. Funny, all it took was recognizing it always was. Sanguango is the representation of the father of one of the game developers, Nico. The character takes inspiration from the kind of man Nico's father was, like the fact that he created music under the same name. And it's clear that he was a kind and good man. He passed not long ago this year. The words of wisdom offered by the character have certainly reached me during the darkest moment in the story, among a sea of other players who experience the same. Noak mentions in his conversation with Sanguango that he remembers getting fish in life, probably with his father. He hated it. One freedom he has in work is being able to think, to think of anything and everything. It doesn't take all that much processing power to busy his hands with mutilating fish corpses. Any kind of thoughts can creep on in as Noah confesses they do. The monotony of life, as Camus describes it, is experienced by Noak, as it is by most workers, and the habit is created by doing the same thing over and over again. Rising, streetcar, four hours in the office or the factory, meal, streetcar, four hours of work, meal, sleep, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, according to the same rhythm. This path, path is easily followed most of the time. It's possible that Noak, just like Bosch, is tired. Tired of suffering. Tired of not seeing the point of it all. It might be why he wanted to end it. As someone with experience doing manual labor and often mind-numbing work, I can somewhat relate to him and feel for him, though I despise his line of work. There's nothing else to do during work but think. Think of things you did in the past. Think of how you can handle things in the future. Think of any number of hypotheticals, jokes, arguments. Think of songs you've heard, or make up lyrics to others. 
but it's all just a way to spend time, while knowing full well that there is no profound meaning to what you're doing. If you wander around a bit longer after your meeting with a stranger, you'll find your id again, you'll find Bosch again. This is the point where Noah can finally get some answers, where he can ask Bosch who he is. I don't know. I was shocked that you didn't recognize me. It was silly, but in my dreams, when you'd finally speak, you'd explain to me what I was. But I've always been watching. I was always there for you, and I thought that was mutual. When we fell, when we split our skull open, I was in agony. I felt every moment of it. For hours we bled and you laid there, silent. Finally you spoke. You dragged us into this strange dream. But I don't want to dream. I just want to be done. I'm not sorry for trying to mislead you. You've controlled me our whole life. What I did was no less cruel than what you subjected us to. It seems, at the end, only I remember the life we live. These intruders, they're not like everything else down here. They're real in an existential sense I can't properly describe. I don't pretend to understand what they threaten us with. I can lead you to that place, where it resides. I must warn you, that place is a hateful and vile realm of everything we'll never be. Everything we'll never accomplish. The idols we'll never must. Perhaps there's some fleeting hope we could overcome it. But that's all it is. A hope. And finally, we, Nowak, have a goal, a meaning. A fleeting one which offers no ultimacy, but one which can be worked towards. And if you go through the game again, through the fish infested far shore, past trigger fingers, then through the Orpheum and its gaggle of music men, and its endless motto Chocarion, and finally through the garden, through ears and knives, aptly named skinning homunculi, towards heaven. Not a place you can finally rest, but a beast you have to put an end to. Heaven is no better than purgatory, perhaps better for someone, the demons that live down here, but not for Noak. After all this hardship, you get to see it, the fruit of your labor. Where are we? Where we have always been. And I'm afraid this is the end. I... We have to try something. We have to try and paint it. I know, but no one will ever see it. And the rain will wash it all away. Everyone who needs to see it is already here. I'll miss this. I'll miss the smallest little things. Our own little world. You can stop. It will never be perfect. Never needed to be. You just need it to be real. Even if just for a moment. Kind of like us. Wow. I'm terrified. I know. Let's... Let's do this again sometime. I'd like that. Once again, I'm sorry this video took so long to make. Since my last upload, a lot has happened. A lot of personal events we shall perhaps tell a story about one day. But not to make excuses, this is as much my fault as it is the fault of these events. I had a lot of trouble working up to writing the script for this video. I had so many different ideas in my mind, and no clue how to connect them. First, I wanted to call this video Brutal Orchestra and the Philosophy of Death, but after delving into that topic and reading up on it, it would have only been slightly tangentially related. Then I thought maybe philosophy of suicide will do, and although it gave me some ideas, it was still not enough. 
and too logical, considering the topic is mostly based on mainstream morality. I wanted to make this video more artistic and theatrical, and I hope I succeeded in that. And that's a huge part and thanks to a friend of mine, you know who you are, who managed to rescue me and my half-knitted ideas by recommending to read Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus. And that was just the thing I needed, and that I felt I could tie into the other ideas I had. Though I do recommend, if you do decide to read some Camus yourselves, like the smart cookies that you are, that you either start with other people's summaries of his work, which I'll link down in the description, or end with it. It's either the fact that the writing is so old, or maybe Camus himself fancied a bit of Kantian-style writing, but it was quite hard for me to get a grasp of it, at least without reading supplemental material. Also, massive thanks to all the wonderful people who stepped up to the task of reading and acting some lines for this video. Make sure to show them some love by going to their links in the description. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this. If you want to see more content like this, you can support me on Patreon. Every dollar is greatly appreciated and gets me closer to being able to make videos like this full time. Have a good rest of the day, everybody. Bye bye.